Generally, the phrase, don't start none, won't be none, is a phrase you can apply to just about any situation in Memphis and make it out unscathed at the end. It means, yeah, this place is run down and really dangerous, but you won't get into trouble unless you look for trouble. That's exactly why I drove through the most dangerous and run down part of Memphis at 7 in the morning. There's no getting into trouble that early, right? So that's what I did. I got up early and left downtown and headed into the south side of Memphis. It was a bright, crisp morning in late November of 2021. As I began the drive, I saw two police officers parked in a lot just on the fringes of the hood we're going to see. They both looked at me with blank expressions as I headed in along Florida Street. They were probably thinking I was lost and wondered why I was headed in the direction I was. The neighborhoods we're going to drive through were called Riverview, Riverside, and Mallory Heights. Collectively, they're known as South Memphis. Here's the map of the route we'll be taking. And this is a really messed up part of town. We're going to see kids making their way to their buses in the morning among burned out and abandoned buildings and trash piles that are five feet high in places. I saw sheriff deputies knocking on doors before the sun was even up. There's police cameras on every block. I can only imagine how bad it is in here at night. I found it to be one of the worst parts of any town I'd ever visited. And I've been to a lot of bad places, people. Now, this neighborhood's indicative of just how bad Memphis has become. It was the most dangerous city in the nation last year when you measure everything from violence to robberies. And since this is the most dangerous hood in Memphis, you could say this is maybe the most dangerous neighborhood in the country. Memphis residents might say Frazier is the most dangerous hood here, but it's pretty close. The violent crime rate in Memphis is up 21% since last year, and the murder rate here has spiked 38% since last year. That's just unbelievable. This is a place where there were 327 murders and 18,000 reported violent crimes. And that's just what's reported. That's 50 violent crimes a day, or more than two every hour. And keep in mind, Memphis only has 650,000 people, so 327 murders is a lot. City leaders have plans to control the violence here by hiring hundreds of additional police officers, but that's been tough. Memphis is reportedly offering $15,000 signing bonuses to aid in the recruitment effort. But would you want to be a cop in Memphis? Would your spouse even let you be a cop in Memphis? I don't think so. Of course, I've talked about it a lot. There's a huge connection between poverty, drugs, and crime in America. Here in Memphis, 28% of the population lives in poverty, and I'd estimate 80 to 90% of the homes we're going to drive through live in poverty. And what's really sad is 28% only makes Memphis the ninth poorest city in the nation. Detroit's poverty rate's 10% higher. Of course, in some places, Memphis is still a pretty city with lots of history and culture. But the crime rate here is quadrupled, and a lot of the poor kids don't go to class, and a lot of their parents are locked up. Gangs are a big deal here, and the cops just have trouble holding people accountable. Now, as we drive through this hood, you're probably going to be wowed by the way it looks and wonder how a place can get this bad. I mean, at one point, Memphis was on the upswing, and it was even growing faster than Nashville. This was the birthplace of the blues and the birthplace of Elvis, but... Memphis has always been pretty dangerous and poor. I mean, it's along the Mississippi Delta, which is the poorest part of the country. So it's not like the place was a southern utopia or anything. You could say the same thing about Chattanooga and Knoxville, too. But while the rest of Tennessee's large cities are getting better, Memphis is getting worse and worse. Well, that's just the America we live in today, though. We see once proud cities crumbling all over the place as people leave for nicer suburbs or for a new start instead of remaining to help fix things. It's easy to blame mismanagement on former leaders, but ultimately it was the residents themselves who elected them and who have failed to enact change. After driving around for an hour on this side of town, I could see this whole part of town one day just disappearing, like what you see in places like Detroit, just wiped off the map. Is that what's going to happen to these people? Are they just going to go away like so many other folks in places like this? Where are they going to go? And will it be any better when they get there? Because I can't imagine it could be worse. I wonder if Elvis would be sad about the way his hometown looks these days. Hey, Mappy, that's a pretty cool getup you got going on there. So apropos. And yes, I think Elvis would be pretty sad about 
seeing how the people are living in Memphis these days. You know, he grew up very poor himself, so I'm sure he can identify with what these folks are going through. Went to a party at the county jail. Happy, that's not very nice. Some of these people might be in jail right now. Okay, so you were a police officer in Memphis for a while? Yes. Actually, I got my, this is the first squad car that I drove. Uh, I, made. I got uh, a model of it with my police number on it. And uh, yeah, it opens up. And Because back then when I came on, we had the old Crown Vicks. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, so like, can you give people an idea on like how bad Memphis was for crime and stuff when you were there working as a police officer and like how things are now? I retired in 2008 um, and I was forced to retire because I was injured in the line of duty while fighting with the suspect I was uh, had under arrest. And so that like crushed my career. But as I was retiring, before I was leaving, I noticed that the people no longer feared the police. When I, and when I say fear, you, you know, when I first started at the site of, or even when I grew up, because I'm, I'm from here, at the site of a squad car, uh, you would leave, you would scatter, or you would act right. And so as the end of my career, I noticed that they had all, this was in 2008 that they were already like basically squaring up with us when we pulled up so it was like ready to war go to war as soon as we pulled up and now it's even worse i think i wrote something for you just in the last 24 hours let me tell you how bad it is last 24 hours alone last 24 hours we had four shot two dead the two uh that are gone are 14 and 15 years old uh, one female that was shot and killed in the White Haven area, a uh, person shot critically at a church, two shot at a store, uh, a, store clerk with, a stir, store clerk was shot and beaten, uh, and it had a high speed chase with a homicide suspect and it ended up uh, in a crash and being and flipped over. And this was in the last 24 hours alone and it's all scattered. So, you know, the high speed chase and uh, one of the shootings was in the Cordova area, which is one of the better areas of Memphis. And the other one was in what we call the hoods. And in 24 hours, all that happened. Yeah. This is only what I wrote down. Yeah. But, uh, just um, a typical a, Friday in Memphis. More. Yeah. But in one of them, um, uh, a nine month old is fighting for his life because he was Christmas shopping with his, in his dad's arm at the mall and the dad was shot and killed and the baby was shot. They said multiple times. And, so they had no regard for his life, him holding his nine month old child, still killed him and shot the child and kept going. And so they're still looking for that person. So why, how did things get to this point? I guess that's the first question is, how did it go from respecting the law to challenging the law and flaunting the law in Memphis? Well, one of the things um, is the police can't police the way they used to, because everyone is uh, living in fear. You know, it's always a lawsuit. Everyone is pretty much scared of everyone. Um, and sometimes as an officer, you have to do what you have to do in certain situations. But the officer can go out and arrest and all of that. But the problem is the justice system. Um, getting the criminals to stay behind bars longer. And I'm going to give an example of that. Uh, the state line, I know North Mississippi, I, I saw that you covered that before. And it's just across the state line, Mississippi versus Tennessee, which is the Memphis area. And if you look, I think Mississippi have three strikes, three felony strikes. But the people don't commit the same crimes as they do in Memphis, although they do, but nowhere near as much. And that's because if you cut people know, even people in Memphis know, don't come down to Mississippi and commit a crime because you're going go to go to jail for a long time. Tennessee, um, everybody know which attorney to go to, and they pretty much getting off. So there needs to be stiffer laws in place that actually keep them behind bars, and it, it's, it's too lenient. It's really laxed, and that's the problem. So the officers can arrest you all day long, but once they take you downtown, it's up to the justice system to make sure that you are there or that you're worthy of being released, and they're just releasing people. So. Officers are doing their jobs. They're they're making traffic stops. They're very uh, visual. You can see them, but you know it's 
is more people than officers. There's not enough officers. So is it because officers are quitting or because Memphis doesn't have the budget to hire more? Did they get rid of some positions? Well, a lot of it comes, it, it boiled down to politics, some of it. Um, they started cutting salaries of, well, the, if you retire, um, as an, well, anybody that you work in the city of Memphis, no matter how long you've been there, if you, re, once you retire, you lose all of your retirement benefits. Um, and it's not fair for an officer who worked 30 years and they, now they don't have any medical, dental and all of that. So the officers are, are outnumbered and when they do make arrests, they're just letting them right back out. Yeah. I mean, there were times when I was working that we will arrest people. And by the time we finish doing all the paperwork at the Sally Port and we get ready to leave, they're walking out also. And for, people for know like, that and they laugh. At, they, they will laugh in your face. So as an officer, it's like, you know, how often should I continue risking my life? And you all are not keeping them there to protect me, you know, going forward, making these arrests. Because the criminals, I mean, I've had criminals say they will beat an officer and take their charge. And that's wrong. And then probably just get out of jail anyway. Mm -hmm. So when you retired um, 12, 13 years ago, things were bad. They were, they were basically standing mm -hmm. off with you. They, weren't, they didn't obey the law, nor did they respect the law. And you said things are even worse mm -hmm. now. How would you define worse now? Like, how is because it much worse? Because now it's the racial tension. Mm -hmm. And whether people want to say it or not, it's, uh, it's a racial divide within the officers as well. It's, you know, because you can go in a in some roll calls, and you'll see the, the division. You can see the black officers on one side, you see the white officers on the other side. Now that doesn't mean anyone is racist, but with what's going on now, you know, you kind of, everyone is questioning their family, their partners, and people who they say, you know, I got your back, you know, because of everything that's going on. Yeah, we're a very segregated country right now. It's, it seems to be getting worse. Um, yes. It's just, just stupid. You know, mm -hmm. there's no reason for it. Um, so the area I went to is pretty bad. I mean, I, you know, it was, it was pretty sad. I know there's some great people in Memphis and there's some really hardworking people. Um, it, it was very run down, lots of trash, lots of abandoned buildings and stuff. Um, is that, <clears throat> is that something that's getting worse in Memphis or has it always sort of been, I know it's in the Mississippi Delta and traditionally it's been kind of a poor place. Um, lots of culture, lots of great people, lots of uh, history, um, but you know, poverty has been a problem in Memphis for a long time. Um, are some of the places that I went through getting poorer or are they just sort of always no, actually been... they're going through and trying to revitalize areas. Um, so they're, you know, making some improvements. They tore down a lot of the housing projects, the projects that I grew up in, they're no longer there. They renovated and put supposedly affordable income housing, but it's really not affordable anymore. And um, in certain areas, like in Frazier, they're giving you like certain incentives if you purchase a home there and they're going up there, they're, they're actually renovating all the homes. So, you know, people can buy a pretty affordable home, um, but I don't know how easy the process of doing it, um, because even with myself, you know, the pandemic hit me hard and I haven't even been able to get certain benefits, even though they say, oh, everything is out here for you, just apply. It's not. Sitting outside of the store at 7.30 in the morning. The Saver Stop X is not open yet. I'll just wait right here until it is. Oh, Memphis, what have you become? Oh, Memphis, where will we all go? What What is affordable for people in Memphis? What's an affordable house? If, if somebody was going to buy a home in Memphis that they could afford, what what, what would that be? Well, it depends on the income, mm -hmm. but the average income, like if you're struggling and you actually want to continue working and being able to take care of your family, I think most families can average about, a, you know, $800 a month really is pushing it, you know, for them to pay and live. So $800 have, a month. Because is, the light, gas, and what? water, I mean, everything is, is our, our light, gas, and water is separate. And so that, you know, because it's private, they can charge what they want. So that's extremely expensive also. Uh, and a lot of times within these programs, you have a lot of crooks within programs and they're pretty much taking care of who they want to take care of. 
and giving the incentives and bonus to who, bonuses to who they want and leaving other people to truly struggle and fall behind. Yeah, I've been hearing more and more about um, fraud and embezzlement going on in housing development agencies and nonprofits. And it's just, it's, it's pretty sick and, and twisted and sad to hear that money that's allocated to help poor people is getting mismanaged and stolen and reallocated into other things. And it's just mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's happening. I saw something really interesting um, I, I've never really seen before. And I've been to like a lot of bad neighborhoods. The, the neighborhoods I went to, there were cameras on almost every block. Mm -hmm. um, are those like monitored like live or is that like yeah. somebody can go back later and like, I mean, how, what's the point? Like, what are they doing? Yeah, with all they that? solve a lot of crimes like that. They're called the Real Crime Center. And so it's actually officers that are located in a building. It's like a huge spaceship type room. And so they're monitoring all of these. And so some of those cameras are actually mounted to poles in certain neighborhoods. And actually some of them, they will just take and temporarily put like at what young Dolph was killed. They will take a camera, set, you know, and just set it up over there with the blue lights and watch it until things calm down. Then they can move that to another location. So they have that also. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm sure if somebody was watching me, I was driving around in circles in the bad area. They're probably like, what's this guy up to? Like, oh, you was being watched. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So like, what's the bright side of the future of Memphis? Like, oh. is, is it leadership? Is there change? Are, are people optimistic there? Yeah. You know, I always said I was like, OK, I never purchased a home here because I never thought I would stay here. And then I realized that it's a beautiful place. It is. It's really beautiful. It's growing. It's, it has history. Um, and that's, I have five grandchildren. And so I still want them to know the history and to see the struggle and, and for it not to be a blind eye. And, you know, so one day when they make it, they'll appreciate what they have. But Memphis is growing. It, it's, they're trying to bring things back. And we have a new um, police director and it's the first female black and so she's not from around here and so we're hoping that she's coming in with some fresh eyes fresh ideas new insight because you know people who've been here so long we honestly we're accustomed to it we are used to Memphis and it's sad to say that crime and, and violence and shooting is a routine for us so to get someone who's not from here to come in and actually look at it like like you, you're like, wow. But for me, I'm like, it's just another day in the neighborhood. So that's what mm -hmm. we needed also. So good change, good leadership, directions. Yeah. It seems like it's been a while and they haven't really changed. Um, so are they just going to keep trying new leadership until something works? Is that? You know, the police, like I said, Police can only do so much. They can only be so many places. The people have to be willing to change. Um, you have to have a neighborhood that loves their neighborhood and are willing to continue to call the police and just not. We have so many people here that has this, it's not my business mentality. And so if it's not your business, then you're not assisting law enforcement. You allowing criminals to do whatever they want because you're like, you have your blinders on. If it's not happening to you, you don't care. And that's a problem. So it's going to take the people getting involved. It's going to take leadership to listen and change. It's going to take the laws to change to actually keep criminals there. And now in Tennessee, it's an open carry. You don't have to have a permit to carry a weapon now with the crime rate. So, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, we're going to need some changes in laws. What's the bigger problem in Memphis? You think cr crime or poverty? They go hand in hand. Because when you have poverty, you'll do anything to m get your basic needs met. But, th to, but these days, people are even trying to go further and beyond their basic me needs. Your basic needs can be met. But when you see everybody else doing this, you, do, you, know, you just want the fast life, quick things, quick money, um, and it's easier to knock off somebody and get away with it, then that's what they'll do. Um, so it's easier to break in a home. Uh, drug is bad. So people, of course, breaking into homes and cars to fulfill a habit. Everything is to meet a need. People are committing crimes to meet a need, and we have to find out what is that need. What do you think the need is? 
it's up to the, each person. And that's, you know, I'm a, I have a master in mental health. And so I have to look at each person as an individual. And it, going through the justice system, they need someone to look at these people as individuals and determine, OK, why are you, con, you know, continuing these acts? What do you need? Um, their jobs are out here. Resources are out here. And and people just don't want to take them. So sometimes some people it's just easier to them or that's what they're used to. That's what they grew up with or knowing. If I hadn't had a different mindset, then I probably would have gone a route of crime because that's all I saw. I didn't see anything good. I was taught to hate the police. Um, it was normal for us. We knew the procedures when the gang members was getting ready to have their meetings. We knew what to do. We knew all of that. It was a process. They were shooting outside of our schools. I graduated high school in 97 and you can do your research. We was having shoot shootouts all the time. We were, it was familiar to us. And so when you grow up with that, you just become numb to it almost, but then you got to want to change and see my thing. I want to change. So where I live, I get everybody involved. I need to know everybody's name. We know their phone numbers. I know what you drive. Uh, we watch out for each other, but everybody has to want that and everybody has to do it. I mean, it's just everywhere. knocking on somebody's door at 7 in the morning. Get them while they're home. Yeah, God, it just goes on and on. This is just terrible. Right in the middle of the neighborhood. You can see why people turn to crime growing up in a place like this. Look at This place is messed up. Jesus.
definitely one of the worst neighborhoods I've ever seen and I've seen a lot of bad neighborhoods. It's just so vastly run down. I can only imagine what goes on in here at night. That's it. One of the worst Memphis neighborhoods and one of the worst neighborhoods I have ever seen. It's just endless trash, abandoned houses. This is crazy. This is poverty in America right here, people. There's some good people too. Some of them. Well, it was really uh, nice to chat with you. Um, tell me about your design. So, like, are, are you, like, is that your side thing? Is that your main thing right now? Like, what are you doing well, with that? Well, you know what? Ironically, the pandemic hit me hard. I have um, health issues. And so I lost my main job. And um, so I've been trying to try to make, like, face mask or any other custom stuff. But it's hard to maintain it if your health is bad, you know, if you, you're down, you don't know when I was just diagnosed with a particular brain disease. And so I'm fighting that. So I would have some memory loss issues. And so I'm actually going to start uh, recording and try to do a, a YouTube channel, mainly to leave a legacy for my family so that mm -hmm. if I do start to lose my memory, then um, we'll have something to go on and, and to look at. And I'm a, I have to write everything down now. But um, this is just some of my work. This is some Greek face mask that I did. Oh, cool. This was for the Omega Sci-Fi. So everything on here, I completely do. This is how they come. And when I'm done with them, they're like this. Oh, right on. Yeah. Or keychains or, you know, this is for Sigma Gamma Rho. But it's just okay. that, you know, I, I can't really work. I really wish that, uh, you know, the things that I've applied for that I could get some assistance so that I can just focus on my health and not have to worry about trying to pay the bills and live and rent and all of that. And yeah, it's, it's a huge change for a lot of people in the world right now. And to go from making about 80,000 a year to like 25, you really got to lean on God and be like, you know, I'm trusting you to bring me through whatever you, whatever you have, whatever you got for me is for me. This is a coffee for somebody who loves coffee. It's like a cappuccino. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's cool. My it's wife awesome. would love that one. So can what tell people like what when they go to um is it L Allen Designs or Ellie? How do you say it's L? It's my name is the initial first initial is L. And so I say, well, let's spell out L E L L E. So it's L Allen A L L E N designs.com. And right now I just have some Greek stuff on there. I have some face masks with the um, that you can open up and drink out of them with the straw. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, and I'm trying to add things slowly. And soon I'll get my YouTube channel going, and and maybe life will bring more sunshine to me. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna hope, I'm gonna plug you that, and I think we'll get some people over to your site, and maybe somebody can reach out to you and be like, you know, maybe they want to work with you or something. I don't know. Like, this will be a good way that we could get your name out there. Yes. Or if anybody can help me even with uh, trying to, uh, I'm trying to work on uh, editing and stuff because I really 
it's uh, every day is a I'm not I don't know if I'm going to be here every day with the new diagnosis. And so it's important for me to start documenting everything now so that my children can continue running this. Because right now mm -hmm. I'm the only one that knows it. And so when I'm sick and I'm down, everything stops. And lately everything just stopped and the holidays is coming up. And so hopefully I can get everything written and um, my family can support me even if I start to lose my memory anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, everyone. So it's pretty clear by now that elected leaders aren't going to help you. If you don't like what you saw in this video, demanding change won't work. You're going to have to do it on your own. If you want to be safe and want your community to be a place where people want to live, you're going to have to clean the place up yourselves. You're going to have to work with your friends and neighbors to lower crime. Politicians clearly don't care as much anymore. It's up to us. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production. And are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. You can get my email in the description to find out how I can help you find your perfect relocation.